Um, so real quick, um, before, I, before I get too far into the presentation, a couple things. Uh, I do want to clear up a few of the abbreviations just to make sure everyone's on the same page. So uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, PTSD. Major depressive disorder is MDD. And the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory second edition restructured form is the MMPI 2RF. I shortened those. Um, you should have seen the title slide before I did. So um, that's, that's why those are short. And I just want to make sure that, that we're clear on any of the abbreviations. In addition, with the handouts, um, I have given a scale listing just for anyone who is unfamiliar with the restructured form of the MMPI. Um, I should mention that this list is not exhaustive. Um, there are validity scales and interest scales that have been left off primarily because um, they're, they're not pertinent to the information specifically that we're going to be talking about today. And I would ask you to consult the RF manual if, if you have further questions about those. Um, one other housekeeping piece before we get started. As we move through here, I'm going to present a little bit of uh, previous data with the MMPI-2. Um, but the crux of uh, the, what I'm going to be presenting on is on the restructured form. So you'll, you may hear me refer to the, the MMPI-2 RF simply as the RF. And when I refer to the MMPI-2, I'll say the MMPI-2. Um, so if there's a question or if you're concerned, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to ask. So um, I should mention that I've left some time at the end of the presentation for questions, but if there's something that is more pressing on your mind as we move through, don't hesitate to, to ask. So. so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so some history kind of about the, the creation of the origination of this product, uh, project. Um, the DSM as a diagnostic tool uh, has undergone some pretty sharp criticism, um, uh, primarily and, and in large part due to significant diagnostic comorbidity. Um, the problem has largely been attributed to a classification system, and, and in fact the DSM itself is very open about the idea that it uses a rational clustering of symptoms and not an empirical one. Um, I believe the exact phrase is a uh, phenotypic presentation. Um, and so th this comorbidity is, is problematic and we particularly see it present in the anxious and depressive disorders. And just some information there about some research that's been done on, on the comorbidity of these. Um, so particularly troubling is that first one on there where the current and lifetime comorbidity between uh, depressive and anxious disorders has ranged from 57% for current and 81% for lifetime comorbidity. And, and for, for a group um, of clinicians or a, a, as even, even as a uh, profession in general, having comorbidity between you know, supposedly distinct diagnostic classifications is quite problematic. So two of the diagnostic classes that are, are most commonly uh, hit with highest comorbidity rates are major depression and post-traumatic stress. Um, this is largely due to symptom overlap, um, which makes the differentiation between these more difficult. We can look at things like problem sleeping, problems thinking clearly, and, and those are not specific to a certain disorder. Um, the problem as a profession is that diagnostic differentiation is, is really needed um, because we know that anxious disorders and depressive disorders, or for our purposes, major depression and PTSD, have very different treatment courses, treatment prognosis, outcome, things like that. And I think it uh, is in our best interest, and certainly in our clients' best interest, to try and come up with the best way that we can to measure and differentiate these disorders. So acknowledging that we need better ways of examining this information. Um, there have been three kind of major pushes uh, in doing this. The first is a revision of the PTSD symptom structure. Um, the second one is an empirical restructuring of the internalizing disorders. And the third one is an elaborated model of temperament or um, what has kind of come to be known since then is an elaborated hierarchical model of, of affect. Um, I want to touch on these three things, uh, but I'm going to do so kind of briefly so as to not stray too far away from the point of the presentation. But 
hopefully in showing these, it'll, it'll make a little bit more sense as to why differentiation is needed and why it has become so problematic. The first thing that I want to look at is some revised symptom structure of the PTSD as a diagnosis. And um, the DSM-4, the text revision, classifies PTSD as an anxiety disorder. And it has three rationally derived clusters. Remember, we talked about that as being one of the criticisms of the DSM. And you can see those listed. Um, Leonard Sims and several of his colleagues came out with a four-factor model. Um, and they essentially kept the DSM uh, clusters intact, except you'll notice that av avoidance is no longer numbing and avoidance. It's just avoidance. Uh, and they added a cluster for nonspecific dysphoria. Moving on to an empirical restructuring of the internalizing disorders. Um, one of the first to really look at this was uh, Bob Kruger and then later David Watson. Um, and this kind of obviously moves from left to the right um, and, and we're going to be kind of following it up. Um, once again, this model and this diagram is just adapted. Um, uh, Dave Watson in his 2005 paper, after internalizing, he actually has distress, fear, and bipolar as a separate cluster, but obviously for space purposes I, I couldn't include that. So um, for our purposes we will just be looking at the distress and then fear to show how they've kind of been separated. Um, you can see there that the models include major depression and PTSD under the distress disorders. Um, this makes sense based on some of those empirical criteria um, and even some of the symptom structure of major depression and PTSD. Um, interesting to note is also that generalized anxiety also falls under this distress domain as well. Um, and then is our temperament models. So in particular, um, Research on the anxious and depressive disorders has looked at a two-factor model, um, negative and positive affect or negative and pos positive activation or uh, negative emotionality and positive emotionality. Um, but uh, Martin Selbaum in 2008 kind of took some of the earlier work that had been done and looked at an elaborated model and what they found was uh, that they kept the negative and positive activation or affect um, and they, they added a third overarching dimension uh, that was later classified as demoralization. Um, initially it was known as uh, um, uh, happiness and unhappiness. And I would love to have a discussion about this with anybody that would like to. I think this is very interesting stuff. But as I said, for our purposes, we'll move on. So demoralization is broadly associated with the distress disorders. So this would include major depression, dysthymia, generalized anxiety, and PTSD. Whereas negative affect is a general component of the fear disorders. So that kind of lower branch on the model that I just showed. And then positive affect is a unique marker of major depression and social phobia specifically. Um, and what I've got, and I'm going to see if this works, if you guys don't mind hanging out with me for just a second. I want to try and kind of show you exactly what their model looked like, although now having clicked on it, I may have just become the victim of a technology error. So, No, no, this is on my flash drive, but we'll find out. So. Very good question. So um, a lot of people had assumed in the past that positive and negative affect were just opposite sides of the same dimension. And we actually view them as two separate axes. So if you view positive affect as like a y-axis and negative affectivity as kind of an x-axis, the demoralization factor would want, run from the top left to the bottom right. And so when we talk about positive affect being a unique marker of depression, we're looking at a low positive affect. So if you think about, um, for those of you familiar with the MMPI-2 RF, um, you know, restructured clinical scale 2 is low positive emotion. 
That's measuring that low positive affect. So, and that's important to think about when we look at where that overarching factor of demoralization lays. It lays kind of bisecting um, from the top left to the bottom right. So it, lay, it, it lies in between low positive affect and high negative affect. And so when we think of a combination of those two, that's where that demoralization facet comes in. And I'm afraid this is not going to work. So. Oh, goodness. Just roll with it, right? That's what we do. Oh, goodness. Well, I was going to try and show you the exact model that shows how demoralization is associated with all these, but now I may not be able to do anything. <laughs> All right, well, that's right. Um, I don't know what I should do. That's right, and escape does not work either. So, Everyone should be really familiar with this slide by the time we get done here. All right. So what does this all mean? Right? I'll just go ahead and we'll, we will press on. So, uh, yes, I found it. So I actually do want to show this to you guys. It does have a point. Not two, but we'll take it. So, I don't know how, is that somewhat clear for you guys to see? So, where we're at is, um, if we look kind of on the right-hand side towards the top, we see distress, um, and we've got depression, generalized anxiety, and PTSD. Um, for this particular paper, they didn't study dysthymia, so that's why it's not included there. Um, and then at the bottom, we see for the fear, we've got uh, specific phobia, uh, agoraphobia, or sorry, social phobia, agoraphobia, and specific phobia. And so on the left, we have the dysfunctional negative emotion, which is that high negative affect, um, which is associated with the fear disorders. We see demoralization, which is associated with the distress disorders. And then we see low positive emotion, or that low positive affect, which is a unique marker of depression and social phobia. And then you can see kind of the intercorrelations, how these are all tied together. But um, I wanted to kind of show you that so you didn't just have to read it and try and picture it in your mind that, that this is the model that, that was proposed. So now let's hope I can go back and everything will be perfect. All right. We're there. We made it. Okay, so what does this all mean? I realize I've had to, you know, cover 20 plus years worth of research in a few slides. So essentially the reason why all of this is important is we use a diagnostic tool that assumes that, for the most part, anxiety and depression are separate constructs. And yet, the empirical research that has been done shows that that may not be the case. And that maybe there's other things that are associated with the variance between the anxious and depressive disorders, or maybe that a better classification system is needed. So we see things like the addition of a general dysphoria component to PTSD. Uh, we see a empirical restructuring of the internalizing disorders that includes PTSD and generalized anxiety along with major depression. Um, and we also see that in terms of temperamental factors, that both higher factors and lower factors, so this demoralization and positive and negative affect, we see that both higher and lower markers are associated in differentiating these two conditions. So the reason why it's important is we got to figure out a way to measure or to assess the difference between anxiety and depression better. Um, so I want to first cover some MMPI-2 research um, 
as you know, the MMPI-2 is a precursor to the restructured form. So typically what we've seen in the past is that major depression is associated with clinical scale 2, which is uh, depression, and the content scale DEP, which is depression. Um, unfortunately, findings regarding PTSD have been more equivocal, and, and uh, you know, in, in particular we see that PTSD profiles are often quite pervasive. Um, they often elevate a majority of the measured scales. In fact, pretty much any study you pick up looking at the MMPI-2 and PTSD, one of the first statements in the discussion will include some context of the PTSD group elevated a majority of the scales. Um, we also see, uh, in particular, clinical scales 2, 7, and 8 are the most commonly elevated, um, but we also see scales 1 and 6 have been associated with trauma in uh, combat veterans, uh, peacekeepers, and female victims of domestic violence. Um, this could also be due in part to some work that Mark Miller has done looking at differences between subtypes of, of PTSD. So he's um, postulated the, uh, the, uh, an internalizing and an externalizing subtype of PTSD that present in different ways. So in looking at the MMPI-2, we see that uh, uh, clinical scale code types, which is traditionally kind of the way that interpretation on the MMPI-2 has been taught, that a 7, 8, or 8, 7 profile is consistent with diagnoses of PTSD, anxiety, and depression, and that code types of 2, 7, or 7, 2 are broadly associated with general classes of depressive and anxious disorders. So which one is which? I know, right? So also looking back at scale 8 elevations with PTSD, um, we see that in PTSD samples, scale 8 has been associated with some of the, uh, some of the markers uh, related to depression, including social alienation, uh, problems with uh, thinking, uh, including, which may include hallucinations as well. Um, we generally don't see it be associated with what we would look for in true markers of psychosis. Um, so, you know, if you remember scale 8 on the MMPI-2 is labeled as the schizophrenia scale. Um, we actually see that scale elevate with PTSD, not because of schizophrenia, but because of these other factors that are mentioned here. So, in the most focused uh, examination of differentiating major depression and PTSD, um, Greenblatt and Davis, they actually looked at differentiating PTSD major depression and schizophrenia using the MMPI-2. For our purposes, we're just going to be referencing their findings where they differentiated major depression and PTSD. So what they found was that both groups elevated clinical scales 2, 7, and 8, which we kind of expected. Um, and then the PTSD group also had additional clinical elevations on clinical scale 6 and the bizarre mentation uh, uh, content scale. Clinical scale 6 is paranoia. Um, so, uh, some post hoc findings that were done after their scales of interest were reviewed is they found that clinical scale 9, which is hypomania, and content scale anger and social discomfort were also elevated in the PTSD group. So, I want to kind of pause here for a second and think about some of these MMPI-2 findings, and I think it's pretty clear that in regards to PTSD, I don't know that we have a really good idea about what constitutes a PTSD profile. And, and part of the reason for showing you the last several slides with all of these different MMPI-2 scales that are elevated and all these problems is that was one of the issues behind restructuring the MMPI-2 to come up with the restructured form is we need a better way of, of measuring some of these markers. Um, it, it, it's confusing to me as well, and I've been... You know, I've been working on this project for a long time. It's confusing even to me to look at the MMPI-2 findings in relation to PTSD and really wrap my head around them. Um, so, recognizing that uh, s excessive intercorrelations between the scales on the MMPI-2, that there's a lot of item overlap and construct overlap between the different scales, we needed a better way. And, uh, oops. I thought I hit the button. There we go. So for our purposes, uh, the RF represents an excellent opportunity um, as the RF has both high and low markers of temperament that we talked about, as well as a hierarchical structure uh, 
that fits well with current models of psychopathology. Uh, the RF is also anchored by the RC scales instead of the traditional clinical scales. And the RC scales in pretty much every uh, uh, empirical examination have outperformed the clinical scales in terms of reliability and validity. Now that's, of course, not 100% the case, um, but, uh, but for the most part has been consistent. So to date, there has actually been relatively little information that has been collected on uh, the specific problem scales or the revised version of the Psi 5 scales for the RF. Uh, there has been some research done on the restructured clinical scales and traditionally the RCD, RC2, and RC7 have been associated with PTSD and major depression. Um, and once again, the RC scales in research have been shown to better predict PTSD and uh, other correlated conditions, including major depression. So, where does that leave us? So, this current study, what we wanted to do was examine the ability of the RF to differentiate PTSD and major depression. So, for differentiation purposes, we have, we have two requirements. The first is that the mean scores between the two groups had to be a significant t-test finding, so we had to have some significance between them. And we also wanted a mean t-score difference of greater than or equal to five points, or a medium effect size. So for our hypotheses, um, to kind of orient you to this a little bit, try and present it in, in the easiest way possible. On the far left side here, uh, these are scales that we believe that both groups will elevate, and we mean elevation in the traditional MMPI sense of T-score is 65 or above. In the middle, uh, we have, these are the scales that we believe our groups will differentiate on, specifically that the PTSD group will score higher with, and on the far side, the scales that we believe that the depressive group will be differentiated from the PTSD group with. Um, you'll notice that all of the scales that we believe that both groups will elevate are all within the same hierarchy. And you can see that on the uh, scale listing that I gave you. On the right hand side, um, I listed the association, the hierarchical association. Um, for the second column there, kind of the second hypothesis, um, all of these were based on previous research that had been done on the MMPI-2. We kind of carry that idea forward and we want to test whether or not these scales will also differentiate the PTSD group from the major depression group. And then on the far right, um, we actually don't really expect that the, that the uh, major depression group will be that differentiated from the PT, sorry. We didn't view that the depressive group would be differentiated from the PTSD group by higher scores on much, except you'll notice that RC2 and RC2 is a little bit of an oddity in terms of the clinical or the restructured clinical scales in that it does not have any associated subscales. Um, and you'll, you can see that on the scale listings um, under that EID, if you follow the EID hierarchy down, you'll see that there's none that are associated with RC2. So our participants were uh, psychiatric inpatients at a VA medical center or a large urban county medical center. These are both in Minneapolis. Um, we had uh, just shy of 3,000 participants at the beginning, and um, for those interested, the final two slides of the presentation are a reference list in the, uh, the RBC 2003 article uh, actually describes that sample in full detail. Um, the patients were given the MMPI-2 as part of the intake procedure, and uh, the RF scores were extracted from that. There's actually been research that shows that taking MMPI-2 RF scores from an MMPI-2 administration yields similar results as if you were just to give someone the RF to begin with. So no concern about um, you know, pulling that information over from the MMPI-2. Uh, we had three separate exclusionary criteria that we used to kind of whittle down to our final group. Um, the first was, since we were primarily interested in individuals with PTSD and major depression, we decided we only wanted those people who had a primary diagnosis of one of those two things. So if you didn't have a primary diagnosis, we excluded you. Um, what we did next um, was 
a bit of back and forth in the discussion room about how we were going to handle this. What we decided on was be, if you had a primary diagnosis of uh, major depression, if you had a secondary or tertiary diagnosis of any anxiety disorder, we excluded you. Um, if you had a primary di diagnosis of PTSD and any unipolar mood disorder, we excluded you as well. We tried to leave some diagnostic comorbidity because that's what the real world is. But we also wanted to try and emphasize what these differences between these two diagnoses may be. So we'll get into it a little bit more in the limitations, but that, that is going to be kind of a problem with generalizing these results, um, just so you're aware. Um, and then the last thing we did was using kind of standard validity criteria as listed in the RF manual, we excluded those people who invalidated the MMPI-2 RF protocol. We ended up with a final sample of 257 people, and you can see the descriptive information there. We had uh, 216 in our major depression group, and we had 41 in the PTSD group. Um, there were some differences as the major depression group tended to be younger and uh, had a higher proportion of female, uh, but those effect sizes were small. In fact, one of them was you know, borderline not even small anyway. Um, and there were no differences in race or education. Um, and if anyone's interested afterwards, I can talk to you about some of the you know, specific ranges and percentages within that sample, but for the sake of time in this moment, I will not. Um, so the MMPI-2RF um, is, that, like I said, a hierarchical structure. What that means is it kind of starts a few scales at the top and kind of branches out as it goes down. Um, so at the top, we have higher order scales. Um, so on your sheet, you can see that these are EID, THD, and BXD, and you can you see all that information. Uh, the higher order scales are broadly measures of um, these, these huge domains of psychopathology. The RC scales are considered mid-level constructs, and uh, they essentially measure the core concepts from the clinical scales from the MMPI-2. As we branch down further, we get to the specific problem scales that are narrow band scales that measure kind of very facet level information and those, those low level temperament markers that we were talking about. The re revised Psi 5 scales um, are not part of the hierarchy of the MMPI-2 RF. Um, but they are uh, associated with, with various branches of it, so to speak. Um, and the sci fi scales have been shown to provide some information on personality psychopathology. So for our results, uh, we first calculated means and standard deviations. We then conducted our t-test to compare these means. And then we calculated our Cohen's d values. Uh, the idea was that uh, an effect size, a Cohen's d value is a measure of effect that we could more accurately quantify the difference between the two group mean scores. So, you know, if we had the depressive group on uh, demoralization and the PTSD group on demoralization, those scores might be different, and the effect size is going to help us know how significant that difference is. Okay, so into the tables, I want to kind of orient you to the table. So on the left-hand side, I've kind of outlined um, and and Re relayed out some of our diagnostic or differentiation criteria. So along the bottom here, and you can see one here like on THD, if there's an asterisk, it means that the t-test finding was significant. And then if you see a red arrow, it means that it met the differentiation criteria for the PTSD group scoring higher. So that differentiation criteria once again was significant t-test finding and a medium effect size, so 0.5 or above for the Cohen's D value. And then if you see a blue arrow, that is a group that met the differentiation criteria for the major depressive group being higher. So from here we can see that uh, behavioral externalizing dysfunction, BXD, and then RC7, RC8, and RC9 all met our uh, criteria for the PTSD group scoring higher. Um, TH, sorry, uh, THD did not, um, but if you see up here or look on your handouts, 0.49 for the effect size. So it was, oh, it was so close. So close to also meeting that criteria as well. So um, 
an additional thing. So along the top you see it says somatic, cognitive, and then internalizing. Those are the kind of different uh, classes of the specific problem scales. Um, so we see on here that uh, suicidal death ideation, or the SUI scale, um, differentiated the major depressive group from the PTSD group. This was the only scale on the profile that did that. Um, and one thing I do want to say is you see a negative value for the Cohen's D. That just simply means that it was kind of in the reversed order that we had them entered. So um, negative 0.5 is essentially a positive 0.5 if we were looking with the major depressive group being higher. Um, we can also see that anxiety and anger proneness, the AXY and ANP, um, also met our differentiation criteria. Um, aggression, the AGG and activation, ACT, met our differentiation criteria. And like several other scales, social avoidance and shyness, significant t-test finding, but once again, they didn't meet both criteria, so that's why there's an asterisk, but no arrows. And then looking at the Psi 5 scales, we see that aggressiveness revised, the AGGR, um, met our, our uh, differentiation criteria, whereas negative emotionality did not. So, in the discussion, um, just to remind everyone, what we did is we sought to uh, examine the ability of the MMPI 2 RF uh, to differentiate post-traumatic stress from major depression. Uh, consistent with uh, the research that had been done using the MMPI 2, both the PTSD and the major depressive groups elevated a number of scales, um, but when compared to major depression, uh, like we said before, the PTSD group had more elevations over more scales in the profile, and those elevations tended to be more severe. All right, so what I've done here is this is the, this is the same table that I had showed before, and what I've done is I've put an asterisk by our hypotheses that were supported, I have grayed out the uh, hypotheses that were not supported. So first off, looking at the first column, uh, we see that RC7 um, on the RC scales did not meet our hypothesis. Uh, it was elevated in the PTSD group, but it was not elevated in the major depression group. Um, helplessness, hopelessness, HLP, and stress and worry were not supported, and those scales actually didn't elevate in either group. Um, and then none of the Psi 5 scales for that particular hypothesis um, were supported. Um, moving to the middle group, um, we can see that, and I want to point out the THD, the thought dysfunction, and the psychoticism revised all the way down here at the Psi 5 scales. Um, those were not supported. Um, and it, it could just be simply that those scales are so broad in nature that while they may have had some items that were consistent with what we're looking for, just the broad nature of them uh, kept that elevation from occurring. Um, we also see that, um, in general, it looks like the PTSD group met a number of our hypotheses, and essentially um, that even though both groups elevated a number of scales, that PTSD is, is fairly, fairly well differentiated from depression um, on the basis of increased negative emotionality, uh, some th dissociation, uh, specifically associated with RC8, and then externalized behavior, things like acting out, um, hypervigilance, things like that. So, what does this all mean? Um, well, first off, uh, in terms of those scale elevations, um, neither major distress or major depressive disorder or post-traumatic distress um, neither one of those two groups elevated a scale outside of that EID hierarchy this is good right we we shouldn't expect these disorders to get a clinical elevation um, outside of the hierarchy that they're associated with um, of course this is except for a few somatic scales and we can look at that and and uh, actually make some pretty easy conclusions from that. Um, we see that PTSD is best differentiated from depression um, due to negative emotionality, externalized behavior, and uh, dissociation, whereas major depression is only differentiated from PTSD in our study by a specific facet of 
uh, demoralization or generalized dysphoria. Um, we also see that a number of the scale elevations with PTSD highlight the heterogeneous nature of this. Um, and Dave Watson, in his paper, actually made the comment that PTSD appears to be a weak marker of the distress disorders. And, and no doubt, uh, you know, he, there are several um, criteria for PTSD that fall clearly within that, those fear disorders, the phobias and things like that. So um, PTSD, while it empirically seems to belong with the distress disorders, I think we see from the number of elevations that this group produced on, in this study um, that maybe it's a weak marker at best. So, um, in regards to findings on the suicidal death ideation scale, um, there's a study back in 2009 where they actually found that women who had been diagnosed with major depression were 18 and a half times as likely to report some past suicidal thoughts and, uh, and three and a half times as likely to uh, have a previous suicide attempt when compared with PTSD. Um, we had hypothesized that major depression would be differentiated from PTSD by RC2. And I mentioned earlier that it was a bit of an oddity. The reason for this is that when we look at um, some of the research that's been done on RC2 being a measure of low positive emotion, um, it's actually a strong enough scale by itself. And that's one of the reasons it doesn't have some of those subscales. That's why we hypothesize that it would be a unique marker of depression, like some of the temperament models had suggested. Um, it was not supported, and, and that's not entirely unsurprising because there has been some research that showed that, that demoralization may be a better measure of this. Um, and also we know that the internalizing subtype of PTSD is more associated with a lot of characteristics of major depression. So what we may have been seeing is Maybe our group was more heavily weighted towards the internalizing PTSD and that increase in some of those endorsements kind of removed RC2 from being a differentiator. In terms of limitations, the big one that I said we'd come back to, we will get to in just a second. Um, what I do want to mention first is in the uh, diagnostic assignings that were done at the inpatient or the VA medical center, those were done by clinicians um, during the intake process. They did not have access to the MMPI-2 data, but they also did not have access to any sort of uh, diagnostic screening instrument, the DAVs or the SCID or anything like that. So there is some question um, about the reliability of their diagnoses, particularly in response to some of the criticisms that have been lobbed at the DSM. Um, in addition, our PTSD sample only had 41 individuals, and there were some group differences. I, I'm not too concerned with the 41 people in the PTSD group. This may actually just simply be a reflection of, of kind of normal base rates within the population. Um, you know, we know that major depressive disorder is one of the most common mental health diagnoses, and it may simply be that the difference between 216 and 41 uh, may just be a reflection of the base rates. The last one and the one that I think is, is most problematic but maybe gives us a, a glimmer of hope towards the future is the fact that we created relatively clean groups. And for anyone interested, you can go back and look at Bob Kruger's 1999 article that's in your uh, reference list. And uh, he actually has a really interesting discussion about what it means to create clean groups and the fact that really we don't have any evidence that there is such thing as psychopathology existing in a vacuum. Um, we created a little bit of a vacuum to create our groups and we acknowledge that as a limitation. But in terms of kind of hopefully looking towards the future, maybe we can create better groups moving forward. Maybe there's, maybe there's a better way to measure this and now that we know some of the things to look for, maybe we can use that. So in future directions, we wanna create more real world groupings. Maybe what we do is we keep the people with the primary diagnoses and just leave everybody else and see if that has an impact. Um, we also want to replicate these findings. Um, you know, this sample was an inpatient sample. How is it going to look without patients? How is it going to look with military? How is it going to look with sexual assault survivors? Um, PTSD is studied in a number of different areas. And just because we found some interesting results in ours doesn't mean that it will necessarily move to other areas. 
Um, and then also if our findings remain consistent as we study this more, um, we'd like to work on developing some uh, classification accuracies or working on some algorithms to maybe come up with a way to better differentiate you know, this profile that I'm looking at. Is it depression or is it PTSD? And if we have consistent findings, we may be able to, be, to, to find a way to, to better emphasize that. Um, so that is kind of the end of the study. Are there any questions? And I did put my contact information there on the bottom um, in case anyone has a question that they think of later or in a moment of epiphany as you're brushing your teeth. If you have a question, you can email me. I absolutely agree and you know they went through several processes to go from the two to the RF you know identifying the core constructs and seed scales and and all that good stuff but that was kind of a question that has been raised before by other people um, you know Roger Green is one of them and he's raised the idea of if the scales weren't that great to begin with all you've done is cut down the scales what makes them so good now and, and I would agree that on the surface I believe that's actually a very valid criticism and maybe there's more, maybe we need to go back to the creation in the 1940s and really start from the ground up, but um, you know, consistently in, in most avenues of research, the RC scales have shown to do better at predicting what we think that they'll predict, um, and they've shown you know, improved construct validity and discriminant validity, so you're right, it, it, it's certainly not perfect, and I don't think there's an expectation that it would be. Um, maybe this is just getting us closer closer to home. So maybe it's a maybe it's a new waypoint on the way to the final goal, so to speak. So any other questions? It was obvious in four. Yeah. 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 Five may make it even later. You know, I think five arrived with its own fanfare, and I don't know that any of it was, was really all that good. So I think that's the concern. And I think, uh, and actually, um, you know, Dave Watson's the 2005 article that I referenced where he restructures um, the internalizing disorders. That actual title of the paper is Moving Towards an Understanding for DSM-5. And he lays out some very rational arguments for why, you know, we need to relook at this. And then DSM-5 came out and basically said no. So uh, it's interesting, you know, that, you know, much of the classification differences between the anxious and depressive disorders remained unchanged, and yet we've got 20 years of research that says there's a problem here. You know, where there's smoke, there's fire, and we've got a house filled of smoke, and no one's running for the exit, so I think that's a problem. So, but, I, I mean, I think that's the reason why the fanfare was so negative for the DSM-5. Um, why it was not as well received. So, yeah, I would have hated to try and do this with DSM-5 criteria. So. Any other questions?